Oh God, as we take in the meaning of therefore go, help us remember that you are with us always, even to the end of the age. And God, in the midst of all that we face, uh, help us to be open and available to your Holy Spirit so that, that we can do things um, in a way that honors you and blesses you and gives you glory. God, I pray now that you'll help each person hear the message you need them to hear, regardless of the words that come out of my failed and faulty mouth, and, and help me get out of the way so that you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life in the lives of the hearers who are gathered here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, these are core essential verses uh, for Christ followers. And these are the last words that the resurrected Lord Jesus um, spoke to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He meant all different kinds of people, black, yellow, red, and white, just like the song says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And if Jesus is with us always, we can never give up hope. Even when things are at their absolute darkest, we trust in the one who is light. Not because it's not dark, but because we know who the one that needs to be known. We know him. And it's been... It's been a pretty tough week in America. Um, and since I'm a follower of Christ who has the privilege of being your pastor, um, this call from the resurrected Lord um, is the key. It's the key lens through which um, I choose to see all the problems in our culture. Um, and, and so it's like since our task, our primary core task, is more and better followers of Jesus Christ, um, that's what I have to focus on. That's why I believe that it's important and essential for us to say things like, yes, in fact, black lives matter. Should we also say blue lives matter? Absolutely. Should we say all lives matter? Well, it's a fact, whether we say that or not. See, God's word declares that every single human being is created in the very image of God. So all of us are precious to him. And you know what? Um, young black men and their families deserve to feel confident that they will be treated in the same way as I feel like I will be treated when I'm pulled over for a traffic violation. I, I, I just don't have the same level of fear that I think other families do of color. Now, do law enforcement officers deserve to come home to a family at the end of each day uh, knowing that they've done a job well done for their community in protection? Absolutely, they deserve that. Romans 12, 15 tells us to weep with those who weep. It doesn't tell us to critique people for their tears. Um, and this week, uh, there have been plenty of tears to go around, and all of us are weeping from lots of different communities, African-American, the law enforcement um, officials, um, and our nation. We, we tear up together. And um, we can acknowledge that there are occasions when the police will commit acts of misconduct and will also be able to admit that mistakes do happen. And we can also admit that being in law enforcement is a really incredibly difficult and oftentimes thankless job, and they have to make split-second decisions that can lead to life or death. And I'm glad that I'm not in those kinds of positions. But they've decided they're willing to stand in that gap for all of us and make that call. So we can and should have enough tears to go around for everyone this week. That's why... Um, that's why I love the shortest and perhaps one of the most powerful verses in the New Testament. Simply two words, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35, right? I mean, Jesus shed tears of compassion for two grieving sisters who simply lost um, their brother to death. Even though Jesus knew he was going to raise him up from the dead, Jesus weeps with them. Jesus shed tears of anger at the power of death itself. And Jesus said... I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, 
they will have life. It's important for us to lift that up. I mean, Jesus longs for the day when death's power to produce pain in us will be defeated forever. And uh, his own resurrection is the first fruit of what is to come in his final victory over sin and death and suffering. And so the mission of Jesus' church, the great commission given in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, is, is grounded in the disciples' powerful, life-changing, undeniable, personal experience of the resurrected Lord. And that's huge for us, okay? Because they experienced Jesus Christ as the resurrected Lord, they knew that he had the power and authority to tell them what to do, to tell them how to be disciples of Jesus. And so they took the marching orders and they said, yes, uh, we're all in. And they're the same ones that are given to us now today. It's as if Jesus was saying in this moment, this thing is the most important. This is the core that I want you to pay the most attention to. Yes, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to teach these new disciples to obey everything that I'm commanding them. That's what is most important. Core. Um, the core. I mean, there's a whole exercise movement and dedicated to the exercising your core. What's your core? Your core is, is your center of gravity. You're, you're right here, your midsection. Um, it's, um, it's where every movement out of your body arises from, ultimately. So it's important for, for us to, to have a, a strong core um, because it's the center of gravity with direct impo- impact on, on our balance and everything else. And, 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 and it's important for our long-term health to focus on these muscles. Now, see, here's the thing. There's only one exercise that I truly, genuinely enjoy, and that's running. I like to run, okay? The only core that I want to spend any time working on is an apple. Um, (laughs) But you know what? What I do is I supplement my running with uh, with other exercises that focus on on this for my long-term benefit, and because, because these are really important. They're important to focus on. And the church of Jesus Christ has to focus on her core, too. What's basic? What's essential? What do we have to focus on? What are the key movements out of which all of our other movements arise? What are the core values that we have to pay attention to for our long-term health as followers of Jesus and as his church? The church of Jesus um, can't simply do um, whatever comes easy or or feels the best to us. Okay, so there, you, may be, you may have a particular sweet spot. Like the thing that you love to do the most is, is you love to read the Bible. And, and you could do that, uh, you know, every waking hour. Well, guess what? That's not very balanced. That's an important thing, but that doesn't get you to being a part of, of the core of what is essential. Um, that's one thing that's essential, but it's not the essential. So, um, we need strength and balance in every area of our life together. Um, nine years ago, you may remember that one of the things that we declared as a church that, that in our mission statement, we were going to say that we exist to make more and better disciples of Jesus Christ. It was basic. It was easy to understand. Um, it, was, it was memorable. Um, everybody could know it. Um, and it was an important thing that would help guide us on our mission and ministry. That's it. It's a reflection of the verses in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It's just a little bit smaller and easier to say, maybe. Okay, um, But defining our core helps us know uh, what we need to do more of, what we need to do less of, and what we need to stop doing all together. And there are always things that we need to stop. We also said that that we would express these through our core values of of passionate worship, radical hospitality, intentional faith development, um, risk-taking mission and service, and extravagant generosity. And and I'm probably the only one that can say it in the church that fast, okay, those putting those things together. Um, Here's the thing. In Numbers 21, when Moses was leading the people of Israel uh, from Egypt into the Promised Land, they were hanging out in the wilderness for many years, as you can imagine, there was a big problem with snakes. How many of you have got a big problem with snakes? 
Okay? Yeah. Well, here, here was the answer that God gave Moses to the problem with snakes. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to make a replica of a snake and put it, a bronze snake, and put it on a staff. And he probably said, really, God, that's your solution to our snake problem. Oh, okay, well, well, we'll do that. And they made that, and guess what? It worked out just fine. It was perfect. It was okay. And over the years, the staff, this bronze staff, became a holy relic to God's people. And 800 years later, we find in Scripture that King Hezekiah um, takes this wonderful bronze pole and snaps it in two. And why does he do that? Why does he do that? It's the second Kings 18, 3 and 4. He, Hezekiah, did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. So understand, this gave God pleasure when he saw Hezekiah do this just as the ancestors of David had done. He removed the pagan shrines, smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down Asherah poles. Well, we don't have any of those kind of hanging around, so we're not going to smash any of those today. Um, But but basically what that means was whenever there were some idols that got in the way of worshiping God that led them away from their core, a leader would rise up and take them down. He says... uh, uh, He, Hezekiah, broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. So you see, they had come to see this as an object that they would bow down to worship instead of as simply pointing to the God who deserved their worship. And so that's why he snapped it over his knee. And just like that 800-year-old religious object um, that that affects so much, We, too, can snap it in two sometimes, and it will please God. See, not only had that that bronze snake um, been led away from its actual purpose, um, now it got in the way of what the actual purpose was, which was to lead people to God, not be an object of worship itself. See, the bronze uh, snake was only intended to bring people into the presence of God, not to actually be God for people. And that's important. Never meant to be an idol. Sometimes um, we look at the way things are always done or have always been done in the church as an idol. For example, there is no such thing as a program or a ministry or a mission that is exempt from being analyzed and critiqued and perhaps um, being snapped in two, okay? Everything is potentially going to be snapped in two. Why? Well, because nothing's perfect. Some things are good, but maybe they get in the way of God's best for us. Um, From time to time, we've got to go Hezekiah on some stuff around here. Um, Some ministries that have been faithful and fruitful, but now get in the way uh, of of doing ministry and mission in 2016 or or just simply because there's something better. Um, Question. What are the bronze snakes that we need to break for the glory of God at New Hope? What are some programs, some missions, some ministries, perhaps, that that once were a great blessing in our life together? And it's not that they're bad now, but maybe they do get in the way a little bit of our actual purpose, our core, to make more and better followers of Jesus Christ. I love um, looking at Paul throughout the New Testament because Paul was a character who was absolutely driven and obsessed by by preaching the good news and sharing a good word of Jesus Christ um, to everybody that he could possibly find. Um, And it was the same message that had been given by the risen Lord in Matthew 28. And he would go anywhere at any time to speak to anyone about the good news of Jesus Christ. And he would do so powerfully and effectively. But then he was stuck in prison. Um, and he had a chain on his leg, and, and he had to change his strategy. And you know what Paul did instead? Paul didn't say, oh, I, I can't share the good news anymore. No, he began to write letters like crazy. And that's why we have so much of the New Testament today. He also shared the good news with the jailers who tended to him. Your leadership team at New Hope has decided to, to move um, in some new strategic ways to represent what our core values are. Now, there is nothing wrong, nothing wrong with radical hospitality, passionate worship, um, intentional faith development, risk-taking mission and service, and extravagant generosity. Nothing wrong with those things um, as as core elements in our disciple-making process. 
Um, but we're still going to change it. Are we going to continue to do all those things? Absolutely. Why? Because each one of them is important. But here's the thing. The language there is perhaps a bit too complicated, somewhat cumbersome, way too churchy. That means it's unfriendly towards the friends and guests that may have no connection to Jesus' church whatsoever. It's harder to remember, and it can be a bit intimidating. Um, and so, and we're also going to change one word in the reason why we exist. We're changing disciples to followers. Why? Some of you are like, what's wrong with disciples? Um, a lot of people who have no connection to Jesus' church, which is becoming more and more people, don't know what a disciple is. Um, now, we're going to have a disciple-making process because followers of Jesus become disciples, okay? But so we're just changing that a little bit. It's a little minor tweak, but it's a difference. Um, but um, uh, it's just important to shift a change, a small one. So the new way to communicate our core disciple-making process is only four words. So we're moving from, we're moving from 14 words down to four. I'm going to ask you to just learn four words, okay? Here they are. Reach, connect, grow, and send. That's our disciple-making process. And we're going to talk a lot about that over these next four weeks. It's really easy to remember. Um, the language is simple. It's friendly to those who have absolutely no connection to the church or Jesus Christ. Um, it's clear. The other good thing is that's really important is it's much easier to translate into Spanish than all those other words. <laughs> and, and when you're one church in two languages... That matters, okay? Um, so we just got four words, easy to translate. Yay. All right. Now, we are still going to emphasize all the same general principles. We're just going to use some different language around our process that we choose to, to focus on growing in Christ. But that's what our disciple-making process will look like, and that's what we're going to unpack. As faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we reach out to people in our community to connect to God and the New Hope family. They grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ, and then we send them out to serve as faithful followers of Jesus Christ and continue the process of reaching people with God's grace and love. Okay? So our mission statement, our core values, um, will guide New Hope um, in, uh, in its current and potential new ministries and missions. See, if it doesn't have anything to do with making more and better followers of Jesus Christ, we are going to stop doing it. We're, it's going to be just the way things are. It's the way we've been operating. We're going to continue to do that. We need to have as our goal stopping doing many things. Why? Because the simpler we are, the easier things are. Um, one of the things I love in the book of Acts about the early church is they didn't do, they didn't do 87,000 different things. They did a few things really well. They were focused. They got simpler all the time. They were unashamedly Christ-centered. They were passionately people-focused, and they were strategically team-based. That's how they did life together. And that's what we want 2,000 years later for new hope. I mean, and Jesus constantly loved getting down to the core with his team, with his disciples. And you know what the core often was about? Him. I mean, can you imagine? Jesus points at himself and he says, I'm your core. I'm your core. Relationship with me is what's core. And one time he was asking his disciples, hey, who do people say that I am out in the community? He said, well, you're a prophet. You're Elijah. Come back. Or you're a good teacher. We see in Matthew 16, 15, and 18, then he, Jesus, asked them, but, but who do you say that I am? A wonderful and pointed question that each one of us needs to be asked on a regular basis. Who do you say that Jesus is? And then it says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now, I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, foundation, core. And upon this rock, I will build my church, and all the power of hell will not conquer it. And that rock, that core, is the confession that Peter makes about Jesus Christ. And he says, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. 
The reality is the gates of hell has had a pretty good week, okay? Cannot prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. We pray, I hope that you catch when we pray that, that we, we ask for God, we say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you hear what we're praying for? We want the way that God does things in heaven to be the way that they're done on earth. And whenever and wherever it happens that we're not seeing things being done in the way that God wants them done in heaven, then we, you and I, because of the great commission of Jesus Christ, have a responsibility to call that out and to be people who do something about it because hell has had its way in our earth all too often, and we can't stand for that. This, uh, this Monday, tomorrow, Vacation Bible School starts. So a lot of people are excited about that. Um, if, you're, if you're a volunteer, raise your hand, volunteering for VBS, pray for them. Pray for them. Um, it's going to be awesome, but it's a, a joy-filled week of chaos. And um, I remember five years ago, uh, Vacation Bible School was getting ready to start. And, and Shelly and Julie um, came to me, and, and they said, uh, Pastor Jamie, we've got to ask you something. Um, we, we want to do something different. I said, what's that? We want to put the bounce houses in Logan Hall. And I said, um, wow, tell me about that. Let me, let me hear the reason for that. They had great reasons. They were perfect, and they were right. And, and I said, okay, we're going to do that. And, um, and you know what happened? Nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing. It went great. And not one of you complained to me about putting bounce houses in Logan Hall. Isn't that wonderful? Why? Because here's the thing. Now, uh, thank you for that. I, I still praise God for that five years later. Um, but, but the reality here is, this is important. Um, um, being clear about what our core is means we know what our means that we know what our buildings and our new building is going to be about and the purpose that it has. And the fact is reaching the next generation always trumps having clean carpet. Okay? Amen. Okay? I want you to hear that loud and clear. Um, teaching the faith of Jesus Christ says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. That takes precedent over whether or not um, the carpet stays clean, okay? Or reaching people who do, are not yet followers of Jesus Christ always trumps helping people who already follow Jesus be more comfortable, okay? That's most of us in this room, okay? That means if, as your pastor, I have to choose between your comfort and helping New people have a relationship with Jesus Christ because our mission statement says we exist to make more and better disciples of Jesus Christ, and your comfort won't necessarily get in the way of you being a better follower. Let's focus on the new, okay? Huge. This is huge. So we, around here, we celebrate spills and breaks, even though it's hard. Um, when the AC needs to be fixed, and it does right now in several places on our campus, it's frustrating to me. And it's costly. But you know what? I have to remind myself, hey, uh, you, Jamie here, um, this means that the building is being used for the glory of God. That's a be beautiful thing. And that's good. And we need to honor that. Um, you know, it's interesting. There, there are really not, throughout the world, there are not very many um, professing atheists. I mean, less than 10% of the world people would say, I absolutely do not believe that God exists in any way, shape, or form, okay? Um, now, there's, there's a lot of people who, who don't believe much. Um, one of the big changes in recent years in the church, for instance, is that more and more people feel comfortable not being connected at all to the church and not having any connection to Jesus Christ. Um, that, means, that means one of the things that's going to happen in the years to come is those who have a nominal connection to the church and to Jesus are going to drift further away, okay? It's the people who have a deep, abiding uh, faith connection who stepped over that line of faith and, and, and made that confession that, that Peter and Jesus were talking about. Um, that's what's going to make a difference. You see, because in recent years, the reality is what we have a lot more of are people that are kind of 
apathyists. Not, not atheists, apathyists. They believe that some kind of God exists, but that it doesn't matter to their life and they don't care, and they're not interested in pursuing a relationship with that God that they barely believe exists. And, and we're, we've got to be here for those people. Um, we've got to be the church that says, how do we reach apathyists? It's not, about, it's not just about atheists. It's about folks who don't care. That's why the confession of faith in Jesus Christ is so vital, because once that confession of faith in Jesus Christ is made, then we have a strategy for moving forward and helping uh, build on the experience, okay? And what is that again? It's reach, connect, grow, send. Reach, connect, grow, send. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. Um, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Always. Let's pray. God, um, um, hell's had, uh, had quite a week. And we want to be a part of helping heaven become more the way that things are done here on earth. So lead us to whatever new thing uh, you want to lead us to. We want... We want to be a church that makes more and better followers of Jesus Christ. We want to be a church that that reaches, connects, grows, and sends all for your glory. We want, oh God, um, to to snap uh, any bronze snakes that get in the way of, uh, of our ability to fully and completely honor you and give you glory and be the church that you intend for us to be today in 2016. And we love you. We all agreed and said, amen.